What reason does God have for trials that seem to have no purpose? Probably a question that's been asked by many of you at many times. But that question in this case was posed by a pair of 33 year olds named Rick and Cindy Reagan. My parents. My mom had just given birth to stillborn twins. My older sisters. My dad writes about this time, and he said, we sincerely asked our pastor this question about the trial that we were enduring. And that pastor shared this passage from 2 Corinthians 1 with us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation that we might be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from the Lord. My dad then wrote a song, as he did for all of us, And the song he wrote for my older sisters is called, He Comforts Us. I remember mom telling this story at one point and saying, I don't want to be comforted. And I don't want to go comfort somebody else. But I know that their doctor, who was a believer, looked at mom and, and said, I, I really don't know why this has happened. Only you guys may know. But one day you will help a lot of people as a result of this. My dad continues, since that time, we have been able to counsel and support many other families who've experienced loss. A broken heart once comforted us, and now our broken hearts comfort others, because God truly does comfort us. The ability to comfort, to console, to be compassionate even, our sense of empathy, is almost always born out of great discomfort, out of deep pain, out of searing loss. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, the psalmist tells us. In John 16, when Jesus was telling his disciples what was about to happen to him, he said, you will be deeply sorrowful, but your sorrow will birth great joy. Truly, we do not have a victorious, living, joy-filled, hope-aimed love-driven faith without the pain and the grief of Christ's suffering. The scripture even refers to our salvation as part of the reward of Jesus' suffering. Meaning that the greatest joy and comfort that any of us will ever know was born out of the suffering of God himself. So it would be indeed unique 
if we looked at discomfort, hardship, grief, and we somehow thought that the Christian life would be immune from it, when God himself endured these things as our forerunner in Jesus Christ. So as we begin to examine the topic of grief today, yes, we're not going to look at a passage that says the word grief because this is not going to be a master class in avoiding the unavoidable. Hardship is an inevitability of a grief-stricken world that requires redemption and restoration. But if we can come to terms with understanding grief as a redeemable and one day removable effect of death's curse on this creation, we know that every hardship will be used to bring us closer to Jesus, make us more like Jesus, to love others with the compassion that Jesus has, and draw others to Jesus through it. It will not be wasted. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 1 once more. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulations, that we might be able to comfort those who are in trouble. How do we do this? With the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation, God's ability to console us, abounds through Christ. If we're afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which you will also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of these sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation that we have in Christ. So yes, these verses don't contain the word grief because we're going to focus our efforts in the word today and in your home group discussion later tonight on God's heart for redeeming our hardship and our specific role in enduring hardship together as a team, as a family. But let's begin by looking at two angles of the question, what is grief? Because the Bible's understanding of this topic is going to differ from ours in Western English-speaking culture, where we've taken grief and we've sort of segmented it off as something that is associated only with the loss of a loved one. And while that's definitely part of it, in the ancient world, when they're talking about grief and they use that word grief, they're talking about something a little bit more open-ended. So the first thing we have to look at is what is grief in the shared experience or the common experience? What does grief, all grief, have in common? What does all grief share? As I said, the ancient world, they brought the word grief from a Latin root that means to be made heavier. And so when they talked about someone who was enduring great grief, they would have this picture in their mind, you've been made heavier. And it was more than just situational. In their thinking, it was a part of the person. The whole person has been made heavier. Heart, soul, mind, and strength, and it's something that has almost become a part of you in a sense. I don't think it's a bad definition and one that we should consider readopting to kind of move in this direction and to think about grief in this way. In a world that seeks a lot of clinical diagnoses for the struggles of life, I think if we would go back to some of these older definitions of some of these uh, things that, that were being experienced, we would understand that all of us are experiencing grief on some level almost at any time. Because what is grief in their thinking? It's any emotionally or mentally heavy weight piled upon the already existing weightiness of life. Life is already heavy. Life is already difficult. 
And that's not a depressing start to the conversation at all. It's just a, a bit of a reality check because we have grown accustomed to comfort. We, we have grown accustomed to an emotional baseline and a mental baseline of all good. And we have somehow convinced ourselves that real Christians are upbeat all the time, are happy all the time, are just good all the time, fine all the time. And that we've established that as the baseline of spiritual health. But it's not the reality. I love the way that C.S. Lewis reframes the conversation because he said, imagine that the entire world is like living in one giant building. Half the world thinks that that building is a luxury hotel and the other half knows the building is a prison. So imagine when it's a little bit uncomfortable in there, in the building, those who deem it a luxury hotel get really bent out of shape. But those who know that it's a prison, who know that it's temporary, who knows that this is the worst that it gets, are like, not so bad. Another ancient Christian once put it this way about life. She said, life is like spending one night in the seediest motel on the worst side of town. But it's just one night. Grief is certainly an immense weight. Carried so personally that it almost feels like it's become a part of who you are now. This weight becomes so integrated into your everyday life, into the way you think, you feel, you eat, you sleep, you converse, that it makes a lot of sense when you look at that ancient definition and you see that it's just everything in life is just made heavier. That's the shared experience, the common experience of grief. But we, we are realistic enough to know that not all grief is created equal. It's simply not. So there's got to be a unique experience to grief as well. There's got to be a sense where grief differs from person to person and from situation to situation, and it most certainly does. That's the second thing we need to answer about what is grief. What is that unique experience? I'll use that illustration of weight, and Zach, I appreciate you helping me out with this. One of those uh, things that I thought about it and then forgot to grab my uh, object lesson here. There are objectively heavy and light weights in life. 10 pounds is an objectively light weight. Okay, it is, right? Regardless of how you feel, 10 pounds is an objectively light weight. 65 pounds is an objectively heavy weight. Okay, so I'm going to put it down in a little bit, all right? It's, it's different. It's just like how I don't mind holding the 10-pound weight like this, and I'm not going to do that with the other one. It's an objectively light or heavy weight. But it even is going to differ subjectively from person to person. Because I can toss around that 10-pound weight, but I wouldn't toss it at my 5-year-old son. It's just not nice. And it's not wise. It's like a third of his body weight. Okay? That differs slightly from a third of my body weight. Thanks for not laughing. Appreciate that. <laughs> so there is a sense where the weight is objectively lighter or heavier, but it's also carried very subjectively different. So sometimes we talk about people who are strong. Like, man, that's a strong person. And often, what are we talking about when we talk about somebody who's just a very strong person? It's someone who's carried a lot of heavy weight, and they carry it like it's easy. Or they carry it in such a way that you go, man, I barely notice that they carry the amount of weight that they carry. You might call that person tough or resilient There is an aspect where grief can be objectively heavier or lighter depending on the situation, but also depending on what you have experienced in life, you might carry that weight subjectively far heavier than what it is, or 
You have grown stronger by carrying a lot of grief in life, and you carry a very heavy weight quite impressively. I say this because this is where compassion and empathy comes in. The majority of my ministry here is, is to children and teenagers, preteens and teenagers, some college students sprinkled in there as well. I've watched some of them have to carry some objectively heavy weights. Most of the time, I'm, I'm helping them carry a weight that's objectively not as heavy. But I do my best never to look at someone who's sitting across from me struggling with the weight of life and go, that's so light, what's your problem? Because it's not compassionate. Because it might be the heaviest weight they've ever picked up. Now I'll kind of let you in behind the curtain when it comes to weightlifting here. When you pick up the heaviest weight you've ever picked up, you're really excited about it. Like, that's a good day. But it was hard. And you had to work to get there. It didn't happen overnight. You didn't just wake up and decide to pick up an objectively heavy weight. And in the same way, none of us are just walking into life going like, man, I hope I get to pick up a lot of grief today. I hope I get to endure a lot of heaviness today. I hope life is hard today. The situational weight of grief varies. And the weight-bearing ability of each person varies. But the ability to bear more weight is trainable. And God is really good to let us train. To work out our salvation with fear and troubling. Amen. Grief will be carried subjectively by each person. Based on their experience, based on their ability. Based on the immaturity or maturity of their faith. So even though you might view the weight as objectively, wow, that's so light, or wow, that's immensely heavy, we have to be compassionate and patient enough to walk people through their individual suffering because it's not the same. I was thinking about a few just kind of resetting of the baseline ways of thinking about life. And I wanted to just share a couple of those with you. Just five facts about life, just to help us reset the baseline of our expectations about life before we press on and talk about how does the gospel speak to these things. Life is hard and the world is broken, whether you believe in Jesus or not. That, that's just the situation. Whether you believe Jesus is God, is Lord, he is Savior or not. Life is just heavy, it's difficult, it's broken. We know this. Additionally, Jesus promised that his followers would have an extra hard time because we're foreigners, we're migrant workers passing through. So if someone looks at you and says, go back to where you come from, I go, I, I can't yet. But, I, but I'm getting there. The third thing is, Jesus also promised that eternal joy would vastly outweigh the temporary nature of our trials here. Number four, faith, hope, and love are the big three for the followers of Jesus. Faith being how we live, hope being why we live, and love being who we are, and really whose we are. says, by love, all men will know that you are my disciples. When Paul gave us these big three in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, these are the greatest, faith, hope, and love. He said, but the greatest of these is love. Isn't that interesting? Good Protestants should say faith. 
but it's love. Finally, resilience in the face of hardship is the greatest testimony to your eternal mindset because it screams Jesus first. It recognizes the transient nature of your life here. That life isn't everything. This time isn't everything. But it is something. You say, why why do you say that? Because what we don't want to fall into is a bit of a platonic ideal, a platonic error here that can sneak into Christianity where we just think like we just need to escape this place. That's not it. You're here for a reason. You're here on purpose, for a purpose, with a purpose. And so as we endure hardship well, as we endure grief well, we carry grief well, not minimizing the weightiness of it, but being strong in the strength of Christ who strengthens us. It screams Jesus first to be resilient in the face of of difficulty. So as we look at the passage that doesn't define what grief is, it is going to help us understand how we deal with it. And so firstly from the passage, how is grief shared? Who is involved in our grief? The passage is going to outline three participants in our grief today. The passage is going to tell us that God is the source of comfort. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Father of mercies. That he's just dumping buckets of mercy out on us as the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation. God is the great source of our comfort. He's the Father of it progenitor of comfort, meaning outside of God there is no comfort. Our work really in this world is a great work of comfort. Not only to one another, but also to the lost. Would you like to know about real comfort? Would you like to know about real consolation? Would you like to know about real peace? about real hope, about real love. There's also the sharer. Now, I know I just said a little bit ago that we are all working through grief of different weights at different times, and so there are going to be conversations where you are the person who is grieving, and there's conversations where you are the person who is sharing in that grief, and you may have conversations where you're in both positions in the same day. And that's happened to me before. And and it's really tough when you've got a string of, you know, middle schoolers who want to come in and talk about some issue over here. And you know what you're dealing with right now up here. And you know, I'm not a hundred percent right right now. Like I'm off. But you're like, but someone is coming to me and they need me to be a conduit of God's comfort to them today. But I know right now I'm grieving over something that is greater than the grief that they're about to share with me. But I can't minimize their grief because grief is not a competitive sport. We're not competing for first, second, and third place in the suffering Olympics. We're in this together. Parents, can I, can I just like pause just for a second and just swing over to you guys? I get it. Our life is objectively heavier than the life that our kids and our teens are living. It's objectively heavier. It's, that's undeniable. Listen, by the way, you've designed it that way on purpose, right? As a parent, you've designed to bear some weight so your kids don't have to bear that weight, right? Haven't you done that on purpose? You're not, you're not dump trucking everything on your kids to make sure that their life is objectively as heavy as yours, yeah? So 
yes, your life is objectively heavier than the life your kids lead. But some of them are picking up the heaviest weights they've ever picked up in their life. And you've got to stop. Look at them. Listen. And grieve with them through the hardship that they're enduring. Weep with them. Pray with them. Remind them of who God is. Don't minimize. You're saying, well, how do you ever build toughness and resilience? Don't worry. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one to build toughness and resilience. You don't have to be a jerk about it. Now, here's the thing. I've been around here for many years. And you know what I just said is a big shift in me. Because for me, I thought, wrongly, the greatest motivator was to tell people, hey, suck it up, tough it out, you'll be fine, push through, get over it. Because that's what somebody once told me. Now, not my parents, but other people who poured into me said, this is how you build toughness and resilience. All that's doing is building hardness. There's a big difference between building hardness and building tough resilience. There still must be an essence of where you are soft and you are tender and you are compassionate, yet resilient. And you can be both. Because Jesus was. Jesus is the manliest man to ever live. He's also the most compassionate person we've ever witnessed. And it's never too late to be more like Jesus. Unpause. The sharer is seen all throughout this passage. Look at all the plurals. Us, our, we, those who are in trouble. We ourselves are comforted by God. Uh, the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Our consolation abounds through Christ. If we are afflicted, it's for y'all's consolation and salvation. If we suffer, we are comforted. It's for y'all's consolation and salvation. Our hope for y'all. Because we, as y'all, so also y'all. This whole passage is saying, you're not doing this alone. Not only are you not doing this alone, God's like, thou shalt not do this alone. We look at this like it's a suggestion. Like God's just kind of nudging us like, hey, you know what? It would be a great idea. Like, don't do it alone. He's like, no, like I'm telling you, I'm commanding you, do this as a team, as a family. Not solo. Not in isolation. Not in loneliness. And the grieving is the recipient of God's comfort. We know from Scripture that one of the names that Jesus calls the Holy Spirit is the Comforter, capital T, capital C, the Comforter, the channel of God's comfort. It's like God is just raining down his comfort on this world, and they get into the gutters of the Holy Spirit, and the gutters of the Holy Spirit take the rain of God's comfort, shoot it down the downspout of believers in this world to just shoot it out all over the place. We'll just keep that communion free of blockages, right? What does the downspout do except just shoot out whatever comes into it? What's coming into your life? What are you pouring into your life? What you pour in is what you're going to pour out. Are we pouring in the truth of who God is, of what God has done for us, the truth of the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way that that's what comes out of us? It just flows freely. How is grief redeemed? 
The gospel wants to buy everything back. So how is grief redeemed? And I appreciate that I follow up the message on stewardship because perfect word for this situation. How do we steward our grief well? This, this, this heaviness, this weightiness that comes into our life, how do we take it and we carry that weight well? First thing, and I know I've already said it, but I really highlighted it. I really want you to get this. Bearing the weight of life is a team sport. We're like an Olympic team representing the banner of Jesus. We're not solo acts. We're not meant to do this life in loneliness or isolation or some kind of like hermetic solitude. We're a team, we're a family, and we do this together. Galatians 6, 2, Paul again, who wrote 2 Corinthians, tells us that we should bear one another's burdens, and why should we do this? Because it fulfills the law of Christ. He had already established in chapter 5 and verse 14, what is the law of Christ? He said, the law of Christ is love. He said, you're going to fulfill the whole law of Christ if you'll love each other. He's like, you really want to fulfill it? Bear each other's burdens. Makes me think actually of a, uh, a little weightlifting situation we had over in the, the basement of the youth house. We built kind of a little gym over there and I was down there with a couple guys one day and we were throwing some stuff around and a couple of the, the girls came down and they were like, oh yeah, like you big man. And they were really making fun of us. And so, you know, the guys were like, okay, fine, you do it. And so the guys were doing, uh, doing some deadlifts and picking up some heavy weight kind of off the floor. And, you know, so the, the girls are coming over, they're like, oh, we can do this. And so they kind of whisper to each other. And all of a sudden, all three girls walk over and they all stand behind the bar together and they all latch onto the bar. So they have six hands on the bar and they go, one, two, three. And they go, hmm. <laughs> and the guy's like, oh, it's not fair. And I was like, wow, what a great sermon illustration. <laughs> I'm like writing it down. Like, I'm like, I'll, I'll definitely use this. I mean, that's it. Like, that's the picture. While we're over here, you know, struggling and straining and going like, oh, I can get it, I can get it, I can get it. You know, I think I can, I think I can. And like, hey, just get a couple more people and just one, two, three, let's go. There's a story of where the prophet Jeremiah was thrown into a pit at one point in his ministry. And uh, it said when, when someone finally went to go retrieve him, that it took a strong rope and several strong men to pull him out. Again, I'm like, what a great sermon illustration. You know, sometimes, though, we can't always pull people out of the pit from up above. Someone's got to get down in the pit with them and pick them up. And, you know, sometimes the best thing we can do in people's grief is just go and sit with them. Just be in the pit with them for a little bit. Because being in the pit with them for a season gives you the right to, when it's time, look at them and say, hey, let's get out of the pit now. First Peter 5, 6 through 8, and you're going to discuss this some tonight, where it says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time, cast all of your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. And then immediately, we separate these verses too often, Immediately it goes into, watch out, be alert, be serious, be clear-minded, be Holy Spirit controlled. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a lion looking for one of you to devour. It is not by accident that Peter links these two ideas, that someone who is overwhelmed with the burdens and anxiety of life, that someone who is weighed down by life is prime target for the enemy. They're like, that's who he's looking for. He's prowling around and he's like, oh, look at that guy dragging around, not aware of the spiritual battle. I'm going to get him. And then we all just outrun that guy so the enemy gets him and not us, right? No. No, no, we go and we bear one another's burdens. We help those who are 
distracted by the difficulties of life, who are weighed down, who are unable to have that alert frame of mind, that aware, that focus, that clear-headed, Holy Spirit-controlled frame of mind. And we go, how can I help? Because we recognize that they're vulnerable. Big question, right? When is grief removed? When will God take away my grief? Probably not in the one night seedy motel on the bad side of town, right? Probably not here. Probably not here. You say, why, why won't God take away my grief now? Because blessed be the God and Father, the source of all comfort, who comforts us so that we might be able to comfort others who are in trouble. Because every day you carry that heaviness, God is pouring out fresh comfort. And if God continues to pour out fresh comfort on that heaviness, that weightiness that you're experiencing, you get to keep giving it away. Don't ask for God to take away your ability to comfort others who are in trouble. Now, what we're not saying is just live in the dumps all the time. It's actually the opposite of that. It's bear the weight well. It's steward the weight well. It's realizing you're still going to walk around with a heaviness in life. But not everybody's going to know. And that's really good. It's a testimony of your trust, your faith in God, how grounded you are in him and who he is. It's a testimony of saying, I know who God is. That God, you are heavier. You say, God is heavier? Yeah, it's funny. It's a little bit of a, a Hebrew wordplay here. In the Old Testament, when you, when you see any time it pops up and it talks about God's glory, the word there is kavod. You know what it means? Heavy. God's heaviness, his weightiness. It's like every time the, 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 the teeter-totter kind of goes back and forth and grief's like, I'm going to just sit on the ground and just pin you way up there. God's like, it's fine. Yeah, and he just hops up on, on the other side of the teeter-totter and goes, nah, we're going to outweigh this thing. Because I'm heavier. I'm weightier. I'm bigger than that. And so every time an Israelite would talk about the glory of God, the kavod of God, he was attesting to the fact that God is the heaviest thing that's out there in the best way possible. That he outweighs all the other things. It's Jesus himself that says, I'll exchange burdens with you, and you can learn from me. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. So what are some Jesus' first ways that we can reframe our grief? Here's just a few for you to think about for tonight. Some Jesus' first praying and living. We know that God gives us the strength to endure. We are strengthened in the strength of Christ. Galatians 6.5, just a couple verses after Galatians 6.2 happens, it's interesting, Paul circles back and he says, hey, Galatians 6.2, help each other carry the burden. But then he circles back and goes, 6.5, oh wait, but hold on. But everybody's supposed to carry his own burden too. He's like, the burden that God has given you is yours to carry. Now you're going to get help verse 2, but verse 5, but you're going to carry that. He's like, I've designed this thing for you. Strengthened in Christ. There's help. There's help in Christ, Philippians 3.10. We fellowship with his sufferings. We carry hardship together. In Galatians 6.2, we have each other. 
who not only are being helped from above, but beside. There's hope, 1 Thessalonians 4, which tells us that we do not grieve without hope because we know that the end of this life isn't the end. There is courage in Romans 8 because if you are loved by God, you can live courageously no matter what the circumstances are doing. This is why we sang it as well with my soul, not as well with my circumstances. I'm courageous because I'm loved. I have rest because I now bear the burden of Christ as he has borne the burden the greatest burden I've ever carried of my sin. And ultimately, I have peace. Revelation 21.4, and I want to read this one to you because this is really good stuff. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There will be no more pain. For the former things, that old stuff, has passed away. God desires to use us, his commissioned representatives on this earth, to redeem the brokenness, to bear the weightiness, to attest that there is a better burden bearer in Jesus, and to be his instruments of comfort to one another. And so today... Galatians 6, 5, God has called you to bear the weight that you're carrying. But Galatians 6, 2, you have help. He comforts us so that we may comfort others.